betrayal at Krondor. Episode 1, Into a Dark Night. Blood-soaked rags lay at the boy's feet. One by one he tended the wincing soldier's purple wounds, stitched, salved, bandaged, did what little he could in the leaping golden halo of firelight. Fortunately for his roadside patient, he could do more than most. Fingers slick with alum ointment, he worked fervently to tie off a catgut cord, then brushed the injury with a light touch that to the untrained eye would seem only a friendly pat. Others would recognize the telltale hand gesture as a magical ward against infection. Done. No guarantees, though. The stitches may hold all the way to Lormut, and then again, push too hard and you could be bleeding like a stuck pig on Midsummer's. You did fine. It'll scar, but it's good for a noble's reputation. Let's the kingdom folk know that he isn't resting on his laurels and it impresses the ladies. I'll be sure to look you up in Tyburn if I ever need stitching up again. The boy accepted the compliment with a humble nod while he packaged away the rest of his medical supplies. His thoughts focused instead on a third man who slumped in the shadows across from them. Despite the manacles that bound the stranger's hands and the distance that separated them, the boy felt dreadfully exposed. His avenues of escape limited should Locklear's elven-looking prisoner decide to liberate himself. What did he do? Gorath? Let's just say that he had the disadvantage of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. I have to take him to Quandor. Did he kill someone? No. He attacked you? No, not exactly. Well... Who cut you up, then? Before Locklear could reply, Gorath leapt forward, his chains writhing between his wrists like metallic vipers. Get out from underfoot, Owen! Assassin in the camp! <clears throat> do not struggle so, Hazel. I wish to keep you alive. But be glad I do not. The goddess of death will show you greater mercy. Do you wish to bury him? We could do that. It is not our way. I simply am somewhat disturbed that he should come after me. He was... a kinsman. There are other things that trouble me as well. Delican's assistants are slow, but not altogether stupid. Another like Hasseth, and you'll have only my corpse to drag before your Prince Rutha. Sorry, you don't get off that easy. As long as you are under my command, you are forbidden to die, mortal. I've gone to far too much trouble keeping you alive to bury you now. It's time we took those chains off of you. It'll be far easier for you to defend yourself if your hands are free to swing a sword again. You're not just going to set him free, are you? I thought you said he was your prisoner. He is my prisoner, Owen, but circumstances are terribly complicated. Even if he chose to sneak off, he'd be lucky to make it to the next town alive. This is the third such assassin we've run into since we left the Northlands, and I have a feeling that more will be waiting for us. He'll be much safer with me, and I with him. As the boy would be, if he were to whisper the wrong word in the wrong ear, 
He could easily be the death of us. Me? Who am I going to talk to? I'm not even heading in the same direction. It wouldn't be a matter of who you talk to, Owen. There will be ears listening for word of a mortal traveling with a noble. Damnation! I should have thought about this before you entered the camp. For the time being, you're my squire. Once we arrive safely at the palace, you'll be free to go your own way. But I have pressing business in Tyburn. This is not a subject for debate. We must get to Crondor. My mission is of critical importance, and I don't have time to improvise an easy solution. The only other possible option would be to slit your throat and leave you dying, and I have absolutely no desire to do that. Now let's get moving before Talikin's assassins catch our scent again. They'll likely come looking when Hasseth doesn't return from his mission. Finding the gates jammed, they are forced to enter the palace through the royal sewers. During their foray into the depths, they run into James, Locklear's longtime friend. After a short conversation, he sends them on their way. The gates swung open. Revolted by the thick scent of excrement in the chamber, Locklear hastened to the ladder affixed to the far wall and ascended its filth-slung rungs. Behind him, Gorath and Owen reluctantly did likewise, gagging on the noxious vapors in the shaft. This is nothing. All the windows in the palace are open right now. You ought to smell it in the winter. Darkness surrounded them as they slithered out of the privy, their only impressions of the chamber provided by the faint flicker of distant firelight. Ten yards before them, the hall joined with an elaborate colonnade stretching in either direction. Somehow, I hadn't pictured my first visit to Crondor like this. What, you didn't like the romantic duo? Not many get to see that way into the palace. Drawing up short, Lockyer's features brightened as he observed a pair of approaching figures lost in conversation. Self-conscious of his bedraggled condition, he straightened his uniform and cleared his throat with a stentorian air. <clears throat> Greetings, Prince Arutha, and Master Magician Pug. As glad as I am at the sight of you safely home again, Locklear, I can't say that my nose is as well pleased. I thought we'd broken you and Senior James of clamoring round in the sewers. You know the way of old habits, Highness. We encountered a bit of trouble with the gates, so I chose a more expedient, though somewhat disagreeable, path. It came to a happy end, however. James told us to send word that he is well and would see you in the morning. <laughs> Incurable sewer rats, the both of you. I shall have to order that each of you be accompanied by a score of washing maidens to keep you presentable enough for court. Welcome home, Lucky. Thank you. As happy as I am to be here, I'm afraid I come with bad news from the Northlands. I expected as much. With the false Nighthawks prowling my streets above and below, it can only mean the Moradel are up to their old mischief. What do you know? Motioning to Gorath, Locklear introduced the former Moradel chieftain with a wave. Slowly, Gorath lowered his hood. The gasps and startled reactions of those crowding the hall helped mask the stealthy entrance of a second Mordel into the chamber. This one, armed with a longbow. Assassin, get down! A whisper led him through madness. He stumbled forward with unfamiliar feet ten times too small to belong to a warrior. There were lights on the hills all around him, fires, voices shouting through a downpour of sloshing hoofbeats. He reached for his sword, then remembered he hadn't a sword that night. He had only been a boy of twelve midsummers, only a boy and yet he led the remains of his father's tribe. 
River of men coursed together in a bleeding tide, and he was amidst them. Screams rang. A howling figure silhouetted himself against the moon and brandished a bloody sword aloft. The wolfish figure screamed words of wrath and damnation as he cleaved his way through his Moradel brothers. He was Delacon, former general of Mermandamus, leader of the unified tribes of the Northland, and he was the enemy. The memory detonated into a million fading thoughts, each fleeing after the faint echoes of a weak whisper. Before him now there was a new image. The face of a fair young girl whose pale blue eyes watched him with weary interest. I cannot find the truth, my prince. His mind is chaotic. I find images, but I cannot hold them long enough to understand. He hides his thoughts. Gorath is Moradel. Even with Gamina's exceptional talent for sensing thoughts, his mind may have many innate psychic defenses. I may need to send for one of my more advanced students. No need to disturb studies, Master Magician Bug. The Moradel speaks truly. Council members exchanged surprised glances and turned their attention to the aged magician seated next to Pug. Lowering his eyes, the man made a dismissive gesture. Forgive me, I do not mean to presume, but I have looked into his mind as well. War in the kingdom would have many wide-ranging effects, not the least of which would lead to the disruption of trade between our worlds. My emperor of Sura Nawani would be most displeased if our rift-making secrets were seized by barbarians in warfare. Trading agreements notwithstanding, the mortal watch your borders, Nighthawks spy on your imperial cousins, and before the snows there shall be an army come to the kingdom. Heed my words, Prince of Krondor, you must prepare your troops. Arutha stood, anger contorting his features, and leaned forward, bringing his fist down upon the table in front of him. What I must or must not do will not be dictated by a dissident Moradel. If not for Loxias good faith in you, I would have had your head staked on a pole and paraded up and down the low quarters of Grondor once I saw you. I have been tolerant while I listen to your vague speculations based on incidental half-heard conversations. But how am I to believe what you say? What evidence have you laid before this council to prove what Delicon intends to do? What evidence? I bear the humiliation of betraying my vow as a mortal and the indignity of surrendering to a sworn enemy. Why betray the Lycan to the Kingdom of the Isles? Of what benefit to you is it to snare him? He is leader by name only. However bitter a draught the Lycan may be for your kith and kin to drink, magician, his rule is black poison in the gullets of me and mine. Already he enslaves my cousins and rapes the land. Bloody his nose, Prince of Krondor. Blunt his swords, and the unified tribes will cast him down in wrath. Let him cross your northern border, however, and ten other clans will join their strength to his, and the legacy of Mermandamus will be but a spark next to his glory. Where would you have me send my troops, if indeed he intends to strike against one of our northernmost possessions? Which castle shall I garrison for the attack? High Castle? Iron Pass? North Warden, if I am to fight a war by my teeth, tell me where you would have me fight it. Would that I could tell you. Delican holds in good confidence a handful of cowering dogs, and among them only a few are privy to his war plans. His private councils are restricted to choice individuals. His advisors, Nerib and Nago, his mistress, Lialin, his son, Morealf, and Nighthawks. He keeps foul company, that leader of yours. Your Highness, if you give me leave, I believe I can find the evidence of Delican's intent. I will need someone to accompany me to Romney, supplies for my journey, and a small parcel of gold. Romney? What do you think you can find in a provincial river town in the heart of the kingdom? I am to catch a bird in flight. Of late, Delican has emptied a good deal of his treasury to revive the service of the Nighthawks. 
In exchange, he has demanded tactical information about Kingdom Holdings. He's turned the Guild of Assassins into a Guild of Spies? Only for a time. Although the payments have been left in various hidden locales, the messengers were always sent to a rendezvous at Romney. If I go there, I may be able to intercept information concerning a forthcoming attack. Would such evidence suffice? Perhaps. Damn me, but I don't trust you, Gorath. How do I know that this isn't a plot of yours? We can weigh evidence to our heart's content, and your cousins could be slitting the throats of my serfs as we sit dawdling. Go to Romney. But you will provide for yourself. If this is part of some secret Mordell scheme, I will not look the fool before the world. Hug. Unroll the map for me. The scroll smelled of dust. Scrawled in chicken scratches and spider tracks, tiny lines staggered across the moth-eaten paper, indicating the paths that were major roads within the kingdom. Pointer in hand, Arutha bent over the map and pointed to a large black dot. We are here, in Crondor. At dawn tomorrow, you will leave the main gate with your escort, Senior James. I know you might have preferred Lockley's company, but he has business elsewhere. You will head to Romney. Providing one of Delicon's assassins doesn't slit your throat first, you should reach the Ursine Ford within the month. In Romney, you will join a special detachment of King Liam's soldiers staying at the Black Sheep Tavern. They may be of service to you. Nodding, Gorath took in Arutha's advice, listening studiously as the Prince reviewed the details. If you find the evidence, I will act only when James has conveyed the information to me. Is that clear? Only when I receive James's word. Until then, I wait. Understood. Good. Why don't you let Gamina and Makala show you around Crondor? I have a few things I need to consider alone. Reading the offer as a polite dismissal, the worn council members began to file out the door, most glad to be on their feet again following the grueling session. As Pug passed by, however, Arutha snagged his sleeve and drew him back to the table. If you don't mind, I would have your counsel, Cousin Pug. Certainly. I am all attention. As I see it, Delacon could have only two potential targets for the attack into the kingdom, High Castle and North Warden. His fortress at Sarsagath is 300 miles to the north, and I doubt he has the resources to defend a line for that long. So an attack on North Warden seems unlikely, which is a viable alternative, but neither target seems to have an obvious goal. I know you are no field strategist, and you hate to become involved in state matters, but I should like you to delay your return to your home in Stardock for a while. I feel ill at ease. You are not alone in that. I too have sensed something unusual in the air, but I won't ascribe it to anything as dire as magic. More likely suffer from bad soup. Feelings aside, I will call up the militia reserves from Malak's Cross, Darkmoor, and Lighten, and join them to the detachment of the Crondorian Lancers just outside of the Dimwood. Games will send word to me there. What of the garrison? It will remain in place. I've considered the option of a full push to the south, and it seems unlikely, but I will give Delicon nothing. Our agreement remains. Now we wait. God's help Gorath if he betrays us to the Moradel. James and Gorath meet Owen in the sewers under Crondor, and the trio travel to Romney to rendezvous with a detachment of King Liam's troops at the Black Sheep Tavern. Even as they threw the door open, James bit back the impulse to vomit. Kingdom soldiers lay scattered about the room each lying in his own coagulating pool of blood. Nowhere did there appear to be anyone untouched by murderous hands.